Hello everyone and welcome on board to RGV Aerial Photography Starbase Flyer Review Episode 4. This is Mauricio, your photographer and guide for today. We'll be covering updates at SpaceX Starbase facilities, cruising at an altitude of 10,500 feet. These photos were taken Friday, May the 26th with some additional ground shots. We have overflights starting at Massey's test site, Sanchez, and the build site, with our final destination being the launch site. So fasten your seatbelts and enjoy the flight. Here we see 22.25 acres of Massey's test site, where SpaceX tests structural articles, ships, and soon, boosters. Comparing the first flight we're taking on Saturday, May the 20th. And here is the second photo of Massey's taken on May 26th. There have been quite a few notable changes. Starting our tour of Massey's, let's take a look at the new booster cryogenic test pad being constructed. Compared to the last flyover, we can now see that the base layer of concrete has been poured. This is a sacrificial layer without any underlayment, such as rebar. It's meant to smooth out the work surface for formwork and rebar placement in the next few days. The cryoproofing test pad will need extra reinforcement with multiple layers of rebar connecting the friction piles with the test article embeds and concrete into a pile cap. We can expect additional rebar and concrete to be poured, finishing the new pad in a few more weeks. Rebar was added to the base layer of the concrete, as seen from the flyover from June 2nd, so expect concrete pouring to occur by the next week. We can also see the support structure framework for the booster quick disconnect which will be used to load boosters undergoing cryo testing with liquid oxygen and nitrogen. In case you're wondering how we know it's a booster pad, we can see 12 embeds spread around the area nearby. This is just the right amount necessary for supporting a booster transport stand. Next is the ship puck shucking station located at pad C2. It uses hydraulic ramps to simulate engine thrust loads pushing against the ship thrust puck during flight while fixed in place by the hold down clamps. These were installed before the previous flyover. Just below the ship puck shucking stand is the ship cryo station on pad C, where ship 25 recently underwent cryo testing before its rollout to a launch site on May 17th, with potential changes being made for the ship puck shucking stand to be moved here. Moving down to nose cone 31, Additional testing hardware was removed, such as the flap simulators and nose cone test tip. These flat simulators are not lying on the ground besides the nose cone cage. SpaceX uses them to mimic the stress of the flaps to simulate flight loads and re-entry conditions. Better seen in the ground photo, we can see where the two forward flat simulators used to be. As expected, this is a sign of the imminent removal and scrapping of nose cone 31 after its structural test to failure around April 28th. Next, we look at the can crusher, which still has test article S26.1 mounted on top. It has completed at least five crowd tests, with the most recent potential puck shucking on May 4th, 18th, 22nd, and 25th. New concrete was poured between the can crusher and the tank farm liquid nitrogen storage tanks possibly in preparation for the new cryo pipework being placed just to the right of the new pads for cryo tanks. Speaking of the tank farm, we can see the construction of two additional horizontal cryogenic liquid storage tank foundations has progressed further, intended to support at least two new liquid nitrogen cryo tanks. A footing has been dug, formwork placed, and rebar laid inside of what will become another quad pad support. The end product will be the same as the foundations on the opposite side. On our most recent flyover on Friday, we were able to spot four concrete footings similar to those on the opposite side. With concrete pouring work going on, this is expected and is promising sign that the new tanks will be ready for installation shortly. Additionally, just to the top left, the new rectangular gas vaporizers and the storage spheres have now been mounted in the tank farm. This is in preparation for the new crowd liquid storage tanks mentioned before. Lastly, we and our tour of Massey's by looking towards the burst pad where B6 test article underwent a flight termination system test a few weeks ago. Compared to last week's flyover, the stand has been flipped upright and the remaining metal attached to it has been scrapped. We can also see trucks moving the soil away from the soil storage area. And that's it for Massey's. Next up is Sanchez site, where SpaceX is constructing and assembling various parts of the Stage Zero system. 
let's compare the photos from the last flyover on May 20th and this week's flyover on May 26th to see what changes have occurred before discussing each area of interest in more detail. First up, we'll take a look at the top corner of Sanchez, currently being used as a temporary ground fabrication workspace. We can now see that the possible robotic welding station structure that was constructed here has now disappeared and has since been moved to the midbay. Moving down past the Sanchez side entrance, we see the symmetric steel ramp shaped structure with five long joists, with two of them shorter on the ends. This is likely the start of a flame diverter, or at the very least, a blast diverter. The steel ramp shaped structure is similar to these smaller pieces here that SpaceX has been holding on to for several months. Thanks to Chrome Kiwi, we have a quick render to show you what this looks like with fewer obstructions or other objects in the view. Let us know where you think this may go in the comments. Next, we move back down and slightly to the left. Here on this ground shot, we see that there is only a single upgraded booster transport stand sitting here. The missing transport stand formerly used by Booster 7, which has also been staged for upgrades, is now used for Booster 10. Back to this view, we move slightly downward again until we reach the construction of the water-cooled steel plate manifold assemblies. Interestingly, we still see only three of these assemblies being worked on this week. This indicates the theory discussed in our last episode still holds water, describing the steel plate shower head with only three manifolds. Check out our previous episode in the description for a more detailed discussion of this theory. This week's new addition to this area is a couple of pallets of strangely shaped thick steel plates. We can see some notches in these two lower thick steel plates and the same with the back two. They are located here and here indicating their use as a key for alignment, and more importantly, indicating these locations will be used for spreading out loads along the first surface of the semicircles on the right. In this concept, courtesy of the space engineer, these five brackets are used to firmly secure the steel plates onto the three manifolds to help avoid any welds or elbows being broken during transport, installation, or high energy events at the launch site. The fifth bracket goes with the smaller manifolds as a single, unlike the others in pairs, due to the extended pipes that extend out to the manifold. Next, we have the new Mega Bay pre-assembly section construction area next to the water-cooled steel plate manifold assembly area. We now see even more sections being worked on here, with five complete pre-assembled corner segments and the groundwork for a six. This means all segments have been assembled for level two of the new Mega Bay, and the first sections for level three are also starting to be assembled. The external beams on all these sections are actually being painted gray. SpaceX may want the exterior look of the new Mega Bay to match all the other entirely constructed bays at Starbase. This is also the case as it is the gray color agreed upon in the color scheme per decided upon by multiple parties, including Cameron County. Now we move down to the right of the assembly area. At the Sanchez substation, we can observe more developments around the left of the natural gas generators. The vacant concrete pads we saw in the last flyover now have Tesla Megapacks installed. This is yet another instance of a crossover between Tesla and SpaceX. Each of these approximate 3 megawatt battery packs will allow for a smoother current and loads reaching the build site, preventing blackouts and reducing the need for natural gas generators to be used as a peaker plant. Now let's hop over to the beginning of Remedios Avenue, where we find the inventory tent. The first thing we notice here is the newly painted number zones on the ground outside the tent. These should make it much easier to track different inventory items when appropriately used. Over on the other side of the tent, we can see that the four griffins that were situated here are now gone. Since the last flyover, these have been installed on Booster 11's methane tank in the Mega Bay. And our last stop at Sanchez is the Rocket Garden. Here we see from left to right situated on the holding pads, Booster 10, Booster 4, SN15, Ship 27, and Ship 20. And opposite these, we see Ship 26 still sitting on the engine installation stand supported by the LR1750 crawler crane. We now move from the Sanchez site over to the build site. We also move back in time to 10 years ago where this area was a large open field with only two houses. One was owned by the Pointers, Maria was SpaceX's first neighbor who showed us what was happening here from her bedroom window and backdoor kitchen porch and helped fan the flames of excitement. The last four years have had the most dramatic changes despite still building out in the open fields. 
While years later, through our flowers, we can now peer into the foundations of the rocket factory of the future with more detail than ever before, as Starship brings forth humanity's next frontier. Starting with the area next to the Rocket Garden is the recently leased plot of exposed Earth between the Rocket Garden and Megabay 2. It has been cleared significantly and has geotextile underlayment to help stabilize the soil. We may even see this area starting to be covered in concrete during our next flyover. We expect that future megabase sections will be built here and staged, and if not, it will be even more exciting on the possibilities to come. The first building we'll cover at the build site is a second megabay currently under construction. The majority of the framework for the first level has now been assembled. Seagirts have been attached to at least half the framework to support the rest of the structure. Moving forward in time on the 31st, thanks again to Lab Padre, we can see one of the first pre-assembled and painted corner sections rolling out of the Sanchez site onto Highway 4 and over to the build site and stage besides Mega Bay 2. On Friday, June the 2nd, a second segment was rolled out and staged near the rain yard. The first level's construction also progressed as seen in this ground photo. Once all the Seeger and perhaps even the wall panels are in place, we can expect to see stacking of the first corner soon. As the first level nears completion, expect more second and third level segments to be stacked onto the Mega Bay in the coming weeks and months. In yet another sign of the imminent stacking of the pre-built segments, the LR11000 crane was fully assembled and raised two days after this photo was taken on Sunday, May the 28th. In the current Mega Bay, Booster 9 is still sitting in the back right of the bay, awaiting engine installation. We can expect the successor of Booster 7 to be rolled out to a launch site soon once the launch pad is ready, for testing and then for the second launch of Starship. Moving down from there, Booster 11 is still in two halves waiting to be fully stacked with the methane tank section after receiving its grid fence. Booster 12 had its common dome section and another section moved to a staging pad in preparation for stacking. At this point in the flyover on the 26th, Booster 10 was moved on to Booster 7's old transport stand and was sitting on a pair of self-propelled modular transporters at the entrance of the Mega Bay. Again, thanks to Lab Padre, we can see a day after the last flyover that the booster transport stand, formerly used by Booster 7, was used for Booster 10's move from the current Mega Bay to the Rocket Garden in Sanchez onto an empty pad mentioned earlier. Moving on to the High Bay, which is used for stacking ships, Ship 29 is seen sitting at the entrance of the High Bay, still waiting for the stacking of its thrust section. Also noteworthy are the two new large scissor lifts on either side. Ship 28 is still sitting on the right on the inside of the high bay. And since the last flyover, it has started receiving its aft laps. As we can see this week, as of June 2nd, Ship 22's nose cone stacked on top of the sleeved E-dome sitting inside the mid bay with newly painted lines. Thanks again to the space engineer, we may be seeing part of a prototype of the crewed section of the lunar starship being constructed. We'll continue to update you as more and more HLS hardware is spotted. Seen again from the most recent flyover on Friday, June the 2nd, the nose cone from Ship 22 seems to have been painted black. We're not sure why, so leave a comment letting us know what you think. A load of steel pipes with different diameters and lengths is also being worked on in front of the med bay. They're made of darker, more rusty looking mount steel that we've never seen before. This work here is likely due to the ground fabrication team no longer having a building to work in. Here is an underdeveloped super heavy aft section complete with its booster thrust section, now sitting in front of the high bay. It needs more of its essential pipework between the LOX header tank and the main tank. Valves are also missing from atop of the LOX header tank. Also missing is plumbing externally from the thrust dome. Sitting in front of the entrance of tent 3 is the new peculiar single ring with many holes. Thanks again to the space engineer, it has many cutouts in the shapes of arches cut into the steel in 6 sections. This is something we're keeping a very close eye on. If you have any idea of what these are for, leave it in the comment section. Again, thanks to Lab Padre, we can see the amazing footage of the demolition of the low bay, only taking 136 seconds to topple both sections. Thanks to Ricardo on Twitter, we can see how fast the four-year-old building was demolished to make way for the expansion of the Star Factory. We can see the workers excited with joy jumping up and down on the race boom lift. Here is a sneak peek comparison of what it looked like on May 26. And here is what it looked like as of June 2nd. The buildings were completely demolished, 
with Low Bay barely having anything left but an outline of its foundations. Comparing the Star Factory progress from last week on the 20th to this week, a few more pads have been poured. Most of the conduit has now been covered on the right-hand side of the press pit. The formal pipework assembly building is being demolished, making way for the expansion to start expanding towards Highway 4. Looking at the Friday flyover, the pipework assembly building has completely disappeared. The low bay is gone as well. We can also see the additional pads have been filled with concrete to act as the foundations of the Star Factory. Demolition of the ground fabrication building is also underway for the same reason. Having reached our final destination, much progress has been made this week as SpaceX is working towards the second launch of the Starship. En route to the launch site, we look at Highway 4, the only road connecting the build site and the launch site. This week, we've seen progress on Phase 3 of power line expansion, with the direct burial trench housing the power lines reaching the entrance of the suborbital launch site, which is where we're heading next. Moving up the image, we see suborbital paths A and B, where SpaceX launched Starship's SN8 through SN15 during Starship's suborbital launch campaign. The first of the two is suborbital pad A, which is still being used as a pipe assembly area. Only a little has happened here since the removal of its thrust ramps back on April 19th, as SpaceX upgrades pad A to do future static fires. Next is suborbital pad B, with Ship 25 still atop connected to the LR-11000 crane. As seen by the number of boom lifts in the background, workers are busy preparing Ship 25 for static fire testing ahead of its launch with Booster 9. Moving further to the left, to the middle of the launch site, we can see that the large amount of rebar present have dramatically increased. Rows of small pilings were also installed in the two footings that would be part of the foundation's PAL cap and pedestals for additional horizontal cryogenic storage tanks. These horizontal hot dog tanks were replaced with vertical tanks, such as liquid oxygen tanks whose shells were damaged by concrete debris during Starship's first launch. Moving further up the image, we can see that the water deluge pipework assembly is continuing. During launches, these pipes supply water to the steel plates, helping cool them down acting as a suppression system, removing extreme amounts of energy. Going further left, we also see two rows of pilings have been installed in the ground running from the water supply tanks to the two buried water supply pipes with elbows. Expect concrete power caps to be added atop these pylons in the coming days to support future water supply tanks for the deluge system. Heading up the orbital launch tower, we notice a ship quick disconnect. This has been uninstalled on May 21st. It could be for repairs after Starship's first integrated test flight or a matter of replacing it with a new design. The ship quick disconnect is essential in fueling the upper stage Starship before launch, and we can expect it to be installed again in the coming weeks. Moving on to the orbital launch mount, or the OLM, this is where the super heavy boosters are integrated onto Starships before launch. We notice that the booster hold down clamps have yet to be reinstalled compared to last week's flyover. In the past few weeks, we've seen a rush to drill holes and fill them with rebar and concrete to strengthen the foundations around the OLM and prepare for the water-cooled steel plates. Thanks to Greg, the tank watcher from Discord, for making this excellent diagram and mapping out where these pilings and holes are. Thank you, Greg. And that's it for Episode 4 of Starbase Flyover Review. Thank you for choosing to fly with RGV Aerial Photography, and I hope you enjoyed this flight. If you like what you saw today, please subscribe for more episodes and content so you don't miss out on the new videos each week. And also leave a thumbs up. I'd like to give a special shout out to the RGV team members, Jake, Mario, Mr. Pleasant, Peekaboo, Procky, Straw, The Space Engineer, and Thomas. I'm Mauricio and I'll see you next week from 10,500 feet. That's all for now.